you very much. I'm here to tell you all about the craziest thing that ever happened to me. But before I tell you that, I want to show you something. This is a list of 100 random words, OK? Apple, ear, banana, mango, flatulence, thought, pear, silence, plum, cobra, goes on. If I said to you that you have 15 minutes <clears throat> to commit this list of random words to memory in perfect order, and you can't make any mistakes, how many of you think you could do it? Raise your hand. One person? OK, you already read my book, I guess, two people. I have to tell you, I scoffed the first time anybody suggested <clears throat> that this was within the realm of human possibility. But it is. And 25 minutes from now, everybody in this room is going to understand, at least in principle, how to do it. But first, let me explain a little bit about myself. I am a science journalist, which means that I you know, find stories that seem interesting about science and uh, try and tell, them, tell those stories to a popular audience. And a few years back, a magazine sent me to go cover this totally wacky sounding contest called the United States Memory Championship. And I thought, what is this? The United States Memory Championship? This is going to be like the Super Bowl of savants, right? A bunch of freaks of nature. And I showed up at this contest, and these people were performing the most miraculous feats of memory. They were memorizing hundreds of random numbers in just a few minutes. <clears throat> They were memorizing the names of dozens and dozens and dozens of strangers who they'd never met before. They were memorizing entire poems very quickly. And there was one event in this contest where the competitors were memorizing the order of a shuffled pack of playing cards as quickly as they possibly could. And I thought, OK, I have nothing in the world to do with these people. These are people from the long tail of humanity's bell curve, totally different from me. And then I met this guy. This is Ed Cook. He had one of the best memories in all of Europe, and he had come to the United States uh, as kind of like a spring training, as practice for the World Memory Championships, which were going to be in Kuala Lumpur that year. And I was standing outside the competition hall, talking to Ed Cook, and he said to me something that really changed my life. He said, you know, these guys inside who are doing these incredible feats of memory, they don't actually have incredible natural memory abilities. They've all trained themselves to perform these incredible feats of memory using a set of techniques that were once upon a time widely known and widely practiced. Techniques that were invented in ancient Greece, that were perfected by the ancient Romans, techniques that were used by uh, military generals to remember the names of thousands of soldiers under their command, techniques that were used by medieval scholars to remember entire books, techniques which had largely been forgotten about. And he said to me, you know, anybody can do this. Even you could do it. Would you like me to teach you? And I spent the better part of the next year under this guy's wing, learning not only about how my memory works, but why it sometimes doesn't work, and what its potential might be. Now, the question I had, which I'm sure is the question you have right now, is like, how in the world are these feats of memory really possible? How do these memory techniques work? And a group of scientists from University College London had that same question a few years ago and brought a handful of these memory champions into the lab. They thought, maybe these people are smarter than the rest of us. And they gave them a host of cognitive tests and found out that actually these people were not any smarter than average. They thought, maybe there's something structurally, anatomically different about their brains. And they found out there wasn't. But when they asked them to memorize seemingly random information, like ran numbers, pictures of people's faces, snowflakes, and they put them inside of an fMRI chamber and looked at what parts of their brain were lighting up when they were being asked to learn new information, they found that the memory champions were using parts of their brain in ways that the control subjects were not. Specifically, they were activating regions of the brain associated with visual and spatial memory. These are the same parts of the brain that you would be using if you took a walk around your neighborhood or were out driving a car. So why would these memory champions be using this part of their brain to learn new information? We're going to come back to that in one second. First, though, do you remember when I uh, got up on this stage, I showed you a list of 100 random words? I didn't tell you or ask you to memorize them. 
I didn't tell you that there was going to be a quiz on them later, but now there is. <coughs> so here's what we're going to do. I read off 10 words very casually. They probably went in one ear and out the other. But we're going to see if any of them actually stuck in your mind. We're going to see if any of them were actually memorable. And so here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to say a word. And if you think that it was on that list of 10 words that I read out loud, I want you to raise your right hand. If you think it was not on that list, I want you to raise your left hand. Raising no hands is not an option, OK? All right, so let's go down the list. The first word, apple. Interesting. Height. Huh. Silence. OK, a little uncertainty. Fruit. Very interesting. Flatulence. Huh. Not at all surprising. Team. OK. Banana. Peach. Hmm. Cobra. OK. And thought. OK, so that was very, very interesting. Uh, that revealed a few things about how our memories work. And I want to go through and show you the letters, the words that are bolded here are the ones that were on the list. The words that are not bolded are the words that were not on the list. Now, Apple. Everybody in here raised their right hand for Apple, as far as I could tell. It's not surprising. Apple was the first word on the list. There's a phenomenon that cognitive scientists refer to as the serial positioning effect. When you're bombed with a whole lot of information, you are most likely to remember the thing at the very beginning and the thing at the very end. Now, height and silence. There's a lot more uncertainty about those two words. And that's also not surprising, because they're not concrete words. They're abstract words. They're hard to visualize. And harder to visualize words are also harder to remember. Now, fruit was fascinating. A lot of you raised your hand for fruit. Fruit was not on the list. Fruit was a false memory that I implanted in all of your minds. What was on the list was apple, pear, mango, banana, a bunch of specific examples of fruits. But when we hear specific examples of a kind, a whole lot of them, our mind just naturally zooms out to the general. And this is the natural and tropic principle of memory that all marketers, all advertisers, who are trying to position a, a new product or a product in a competitive marketplace have to fight against. Banana, everybody remembered. Flatulence, everybody remembered flatulence. Why? Because it's funny. And in fact, psychologists have recognized that if you just take a piece of information and make it funny, you can make it up to 50% more memorable in certain contexts. Um, everybody remembered cobra. Why? Because cobras are scary. Cobras evoke an emotional response. And the more emotional a memory is, the more likely it is to be remembered. There are literally dozens of these kinds of cognitive biases, memory biases, that memory champions use in these competitions. They are effectively hacking the biases of our memories to take information that would otherwise not be that memorable and transform it in some way to make it more memorable. This is my friend Ben Pridmore. He's an accountant from Northern England and a multi-time world memory champion. On his desk there are 36 shuffled packs of playing cards, which he's about to try to commit to, uh, to memory in perfect order in one hour. Now, Ben was going to do this using a technique that, at that time, he alone knew. He had invented this technique. He had mastered it. The rest of the world didn't understand it. He used a similar technique to memorize the precise order of 4,140 random binary digits, like 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, in half an hour. Now, here's the incredible thing. Ben Pridmore doesn't have an incredible natural memory. He trained himself to do this. Now, <coughs> excuse me. all of the techniques that are used in these memory competitions and that were used by Ben Pridmore to memorize 4,140 random binary digits, they all come down to a principle that psychologists refer to as elaborative encoding. And it's a principle that's well demonstrated by a famous paradox from cognitive science called the Baker-Baker paradox. And it goes like this. If I tell two people to remember the same word, if I say to you, ma'am, remember that there is a guy named Baker, like that's his name, Baker. And I say to you, sir, remember that there is a guy who is a baker. That's his job. He's a baker. And I come back to the two of you, maybe three weeks from now, and I say, do you remember 
uh, that, that word that I mentioned when I was up on stage. Do you remember what it was? The person who was told that the guy's name is Baker is less likely to remember the very same word as the person who was told this guy's job is that he's a baker. Well, that's really weird, because it's the same word. Why would there be a different amount of remembering? Well, when we hear the name Baker, it doesn't actually mean anything to us. It's untethered from all of the other memories floating around in our skulls. But when we hear the common noun baker, the job baker, well, we know bakers. We know what a baker looks like. We know what a baker smells like. We know that a baker wakes up early in the morning to go to work. And immediately, our mind starts making all of these connections, all of these associations. And those associations act as hooks that allow us to pull that information back out at a later date. The entire art of memory, the entire art of what these memory champions are doing in contests, and the entire art of remembering better in everyday life is figuring out how to transform capital B bakers into lowercase d bakers. How do we take information that is otherwise not meaningful and make it meaningful in the light of all the other things that we have in our minds? So let me give you a specific example. Let's talk about names and faces. One of the events in a memory championship is called Names and Faces. It also happens to be one of the events in everyday life that we're all competing in. And I want to show you how a memory champion remembers people's names. But first, I want to introduce you to a few of my friends. This is Mike. This is Abby. This is Jackson. This is Donald. This is Anne. This is Bill, and this is Clara. Now, if you had just met all those people outside of the hall here, how many of their names do you think you'd remember? If I sort of introduced them that quickly, maybe three, maybe four? Let me show you how a memory champion would do this. So there are two principles to remembering people's names. The first is you just have to be paying attention when they introduce themselves. Most of the time, when somebody introduces themselves, we're so busy thinking about the funny, clever thing we're going to say back to them, you know, the, the conversational gambit that will endear us to them, and we're just not paying attention to their names. So the first rule is, when somebody comes up to you and introduces themselves, you have to be thinking, what's his name, what's his name, what's his name, what's his name, what's his name? It's got to be at the front of your mind. The second rule for remembering people's names is to come up with some sort of an image, a visual image in your mind's eye that can connect that person's name to something about their physical presence. So let me show you how this works. When I meet this guy, Mike, I look at him and I, and I say, what's interesting, what's distinctive, what's unique about Mike? Well, he's got this incredible, incredible beard. I wish I could grow a beard like that. And so I imagine Mike's beard full of mics. <laughs> and I just take a second in my mind's eye to picture that. And it's a ridiculous image. If I saw somebody was walking around with a beard full of mics, I would run home and I'd tell my wife about it. I would never forget about it. I'd be talking about it the next day. And if I can take a moment to see that in my mind's eye, I'm making a connection between this guy's name and his face that will hopefully help lead me back to his name the next time I run into him. Hopefully he hasn't shaved. Abby, I look at Abby and say, she's got these great big eyes. Picture them getting stung by a bee. Okay? And how painful that would be. And she'd be screaming. And the more color and emotion I can attach to that image, the more likely it is I'm going to remember it. Jackson. Well, this is a trick that goes back to antiquity. If you can pair somebody up with somebody else who's famous, who shares that name, like Michael Jackson, you can make that person's name much more memorable. Donald. I look at Donald and I say, what's wrong with Donald? And by the way, to do a really good job at this, you kind of have to be a, a bit of a, a judgmental uh, jerk. Every time you meet somebody, you think, what's wrong with this person? Donald's missing eyebrows, right? So I'm going to give him a pair. Oh. Anne. Anne's got a very uh, rich head of hair. I'm going to picture it teeming with disgusting ants. Bill? Well, Bill's nose is a little bit crooked. Let's give him a bill. Clara? Well, I could imagine that Clara plays the clarinet. And I would just take a second when I meet Clara to picture this in my mind's eye. And what it's doing is it's forcing me to pay attention to her name and to come up with a visual association that will hopefully lead me back to her name. Now, you can do this with all kinds of names. Jim is in the gym, Alice Lice, Ben, Big Ben, Doug's got a shovel, Barbara, Barbed Wire, Alex drives a Lexus. 
etc. After my book on memory came out, I got a call from the office of a U.S. senator who said, Senator so-and-so would like to meet with you to talk about your book. Now, this happens to be a senator who, let's just say my views are sufficiently divergent from him that I wasn't super excited to go help him be more effective at his job. But I went down to Washington because when a senator calls, you should, you should, you should go. And I met him in his office, and he pulled out from his desk drawer a list of hundreds of random names. It was on a, a legal pad. And he showed me the name and the image that he associates with each name. And he said, look, in my job, there is no more important skill to have than being able to remember people's names. Now, the question he had for me was, how do I remember, quote unquote, ethnic names, like foreign names? How do I remember names that are not common? And I gave him a little bit of advice. And what I can tell you is he's still in office. So I must have done something right. Now, that was actually just a detour. I wanted you guys to forget for a minute. Because what I want to see now is how many of these names you remember. Who is this? Who is this? Give yourselves a round of applause. You're all ready to compete in the US Memory Championship. All right. The oldest technique for transforming capital B Bakers into lowercase b Bakers is known as the Memory Palace. And this technique was invented, according to legend, 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece. And the story behind its invention goes like this. There was a Greek poet named Simonides, and you can see him here in this image, who was attending a banquet. And at, he delivers a poem to the assembled people at the banquet, as, sort of at the, as the party. He leaves, and at the moment he steps out the door, the roof of the banquet hall collapses kills everybody inside. Doesn't just kill everybody, the bodies are mangled beyond all recognition. Nobody can say who was inside, nobody can say who was sitting where. The family members can't be led back to the, to the bodies to give them a proper burial. It's just a gigantic catastrophe. And Simonides, who is standing alone in the rubble, the sole survivor, closes his eyes, and he has the realization he realizes that in his mind's eye, he can still see where each of the guests at the banquet had been sitting. He could still see it in his mind's eye. And what he figured out at that moment is something that I think we all intuitively know. And it comes back to that test that was done inside of that fMRI chamber at University College London. As bad as we are at remembering strings of random numbers, people's names, word-for-word -word instructions from our spouses, we have exceptional visual and spatial imagery, uh, visual and spatial memory. So if you were to come to my house in Boston and walk in the front door and run around for a few minutes, you'd walk out, after just a few minutes, you'd remember where the kitchen was, where my uh, TV was, where the couch was, where the bathroom was. You'd remember maybe what color paint I had on the walls, where some of the artwork was. We don't register that as a feat of memory, but if you think about it, it kind of is. It's actually a lot of data that you'd walk out of my house with without really paying much attention to it. And what Simonides figured out was what if we could take that visual and spatial memory, and instead of remembering where the furniture is in Josh's house, what if we created images of the things that we wanted to remember and visualized those images in the rooms of your house? That's the memory palace. And we're going to do an example of this. We're going to try and remember a list together. So here's what I want to do. I want you to picture yourself standing outside the front door of your house, OK? We're going to remember a shopping list. We're going to pretend you're about to go to the market. The first item that you're going to pick up, and I need everybody to close their eyes, is milk. I want you to picture outside the front door of your house somebody pouring a gallon of milk over your head. Imagine what that would feel like. Imagine how it would smell. Imagine whether you'd be upset or happy about that. And then I want you to open the door of your house. The second item on our shopping list is eggs. I want you to picture a clown juggling eggs inside the front door of, inside the front door of your house. See it in full three-dimensional color. I want you to picture how strange that is. And then I want you to walk into the next room of your house. And in the next room of your house, I'm now entering um, uh, uh, it's like the room where the computer is. I want you to picture somebody breaking some spaghetti in half and dropping it into a bowl, into a, a pot of boiling water. 
I want you to hear the sound of the spaghetti cracking, the water boiling over, and then I want you to walk into the next room of your house. I'm now entering uh, the dining room, and I want you to picture somebody taking a bath in cottage cheese, okay? In a, in a bathtub filled with cottage cheese. And then you're going to go into the next room of your house, and I want you to picture somebody who you despise slipping on a banana to remind you that the next item on your shopping list is bananas. And then we're going to go into the next room of your house, and I want you to picture olive oil. I want you to picture somebody dripping olive oil all over the floor of your house, and then zooming across it like it's a slip and slide, okay? And then the final item on our list, we're going into the next room of our house, I'm actually about to go up the stairs, is pita. I want you to picture somebody throwing pitas like, like they're frisbees, okay? And imagine how strange that would be. And now you can open your eyes. If you go back to the front door of your house, what word do you see? And when you open the door, what do you see? And then you go into the next room, and what is that? And then in the room after that? And after that? And then? And then? All right. So that was seven words. It's not a very long list. But do you see how you could just keep going and going and going and remember 100 words? You may say, well, wait a second. That seems like something totally different. But the amazing thing that I learned very quickly when I tried to do this is that it's not. If you have a big enough house, or can go from one house into another house, or can take a walk outside, you can just keep going. And it becomes an almost trivial matter to remember longer and longer lists of information. Our visual and spatial memories are that good. Now, these techniques were not invented to remember shopping lists. They were actually invented to remember speeches. And the ancient Romans perfected this art of memory by memorizing their speeches. And they talked about how to remember a speech. They said, don't try and remember it word for word. Instead, create an image of every topic that you're going to talk about in your speech. And picture each topic, each image, in a room of your house. In fact, the phrase topic sentence comes from the Greek word topos, which means place. And the phrase in the first place, you know, in the first place, in the second place, that comes from in the first place of your memory palace. That's where that comes from. Now, let's talk about numbers. Here's how to remember numbers. I use a system called the major system that was invented 300 years ago. And it's basically a code that allows me to transform any number into a word that I can then visualize in my mind's eye as an image. So if I'm parked, say, in parking space number 52, 5 is an L, 2 is an N, I would picture a lion jumping on top of my car. If I was staying in hotel room number 92, 9 is a P or a B, 2 is an N. You have to memorize this code for this to make any sense. I might picture a pen drawing on the door of my hotel room. If I was staying in uh, room number 14, 1 is a T or a D, 4 is an R, I might picture a giant monster truck, truck tire rolling over the door of my hotel room. And if I had to remember a very long number, like 529,214, well, that's just a lion drawing with a pen on a tire, which is an incredibly unusual and strange memory, and therefore one that is unlikely to be forgotten. So this is called the major system, and you can find this online if you just Google it. Now, there's a similar trick that I use to memorize cards, but I'm running out of time, so I will just say to you that whenever I see the cards, the four of spades, the king of hearts, and the three of diamonds, I cannot help but conjure up an image of myself moonwalking with Albert Einstein. And if you want to learn more about that, you'll have to uh, read my book. This is what a memory championship looks like. It's profoundly boring. It's like a bunch of people taking the SATs, studying for a test. Like, this is as exciting as it gets when somebody starts massaging their temples. I'm a journalist. My job is to find drama and to find tension and to tell a story. And I realized if I was going to tell this story about this memory championship, I'd have to walk in these people's shoes for a little bit. And so I started training my own memory using these techniques with Ed Cook as my coach. And I got really into it. This is a picture of me that ran on the cover of the New York Times Magazine wearing the standard memorizer's toolkit. That's a pair of goggles that have been completely masked over except for two little pinholes and a pair of earmuffs because you don't want anything distracting you. 
And I ended up coming back to that same contest that I had covered a year earlier, the one that I uh, had covered as a journalist, and I entered it. And I thought it would be like a, an interesting epilogue to the story that I was going to tell. The problem is I won the contest. <laughs> Thank you. This really wasn't supposed to happen. Not only did I win the contest, but I actually set a new US record by mem memorizing the order of a shuffled pack of playing cards in a minute and 40 seconds. Don't, don't hold your applause because I need to tell you that the current world record is 13 seconds. Things have come a long way. And then the book I wrote about this is called Moonwalking with Einstein. And here's what I want to leave you with. It's nice to be able to remember numbers. It's nice to be able to remember people's names. One day I'm going to take my skill with cards to Las Vegas and hopefully win a whole lot of money. But in the meantime, these are just tricks. They are tricks that work, in essence, because they make you work. They are forcing you to pay attention. They're forcing you to take information and figure out, how can I make it meaningful? How can I make it colorful? How can I make it relevant? I am utterly convinced that these memory capacities are latent and dormant and sleeping inside of all of us if we are willing to bother ourselves to awaken them. But to do that, we have to be the kinds of people who remember to remember. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Josh. I'm definitely going to use those tips because I'm super, super forgetful, but I guess it's going to become better now. <laughs> so I wanted to see if anybody in the audience had any questions for Mr. Okay, there we go. There are two ladies over here in the center. Please, let's start with the first one. Uh, hello. Hi. Yeah, I want to ask you, if someone can uh, remember anything happened in their life with details. Great question. Something old. Yeah. But uh, he they can't uh, always remember the new things that happened in the life. Mm -hmm. Do they call this a selective memory? Would they call it a selective memory? Yeah. Yeah, well, let me tell you a story. I had the opportunity, while writing a story for National Geographic magazine, to interview the first woman who had ever been discovered, who had what at the time was called hyperthymestic syndrome. It subsequently been uh, rebranded as highly superior autobiographical memory. This was a woman who remembered something from every day of her life. Every day of her life. I mean, I went, I tried to stump her. I asked her about things that were in the news. I asked her about things that were on TV. She could not be stumped. She really did remember everything from her life. And the more I started talking to her, the more I realized there was something kind of weird going on, which is, she kept a diary in little tiny handwriting. She wrote down everything. She would print out the weather every day off the internet and keep it in a binder. She was obsessed with remembering her life. And every morning when she would get up to blow dry her hair, she would think about what she did on that day a year ago, on that day two years ago, on that day three years ago. It was like she was constantly refreshing her life. And it made me wonder if that incredible autobiographical memory is not actually about memory, but about obsession. Mm -hmm. And it made me wonder if that ability might not be available to all of us, which raises an interesting question. Is she the crazy one, or are we the crazy ones? Because what could possibly be more important than remembering our own lives? And yet we don't invest that kind of energy in constantly trying to remember our lives in the way that this woman does. Yeah, that's very true. All right, so um, we've got one more minute for one more question over here. Sorry, we <laughs> have yeah, behind her. We'll see if we have time for that. Uh, hi, um, I just wanted to thank you for the great presentation, and I really loved your book, by the way. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, how much time a day should one invest if they want to improve their memory? So one of the neat things about these techniques is, really, once you learn them, um, you can progress pretty quickly. And the reason that I got so into this is because if I was just training my memory, that might have felt a little boring. But, and this is really relevant to the subject of this conference, this is actually surprisingly fun. And it was fun because I was spending all this time creating these wild, crazy images in my mind's eyes as quickly as I possibly could. I was exercising a kind of creativity. I was practicing towards the end 30 minutes a day. 
but I was trying to win this contest at the end, right? You don't have to practice that much to get good at this. I would argue that if you just try every time you meet somebody to really make an effort to remember their name, you'll find that you get very good at this very quickly. Um, if you try to remember poetry, which I try and do with my son, I, I read to him poetry every night before he goes to bed, you get better at it very quickly. These, these are muscles that can be strengthened uh, with not that much work. All right, I guess that's the time we have for today thank for you. the questions. But thank you so much, Mr. Josh, for coming. That was very delightful. Thank, thank you so you. much.